Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from. This is Sound Summit, October 2nd, the second day of Sound Summit, second and final day. I'm here with John from Sound Devices and good Carl morning. from Electrosonics. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see you again. <laughs> Great Indeed. to see you guys. Yesterday went well. I'm excited about today's presentations. Yeah, we've, we've, got a, a little... we've got a great roster today. Sorry, Carl. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah, yeah. We're all excited. <laughs> yeah. Well, why don't we just dive right into it? What do you guys think? Sure. I think that sounds great. Sounds good. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So our first presentation today is from Sheps. Enjoy. Hello and welcome from Germany. Welcome to the first ever presentation from the Schöps Video Studio, which we launched today. And actually, we are here in the catacombs of the Schöps company building, which was built in the 17th century. So I'm very excited that we are doing this today. Thank you very much, Sound Devices, for the invitation to this wonderful event. And my topic today is a very exciting one because I will be speaking about one of the core topics of our company, which is uh, miniaturization and modularity. And uh, the whole history of Schöps was about this. And um, we are also launching a new product that uh, perfectly fits into that history line today. So let's start at uh, our very first microphone, which was built in 1950. It's the CMV 52. And actually it was a um, microphone that was primarily meant to demonstrate the capsule, the Schoeps CM56 capsule, which at that time had an audibly better high frequency response than any other available studio microphone. In the next year then, in 1951, the CM51-3 hit the market and this remarkable product uh, was miniaturized because of its smaller output transformer and of course uh, because of a new smaller tube that was used here. This beautiful design of that microphone um, led us uh, to revive uh, this microphone uh, in a modern form uh, a couple of years ago and we presented the V4 studio microphone and uh, this is a very uh, nice product uh, which was, was launched a couple of years ago. Then in 1952 the M201 was presented and uh, once again it was miniaturized a lot compared to its uh, predecessor. Here the diameter is uh, about 23 millimeters. And uh, the trick of the miniaturized 201 is that um, the output transformer and some other elements were placed outside the microphone housing in a pot in the microphone cable. And so the visible part of the microphone uh, was uh, becoming very small. You see that capsule head with the two capsule here. Already here we had an interchangeable capsule because there were a couple of different capsules available for that microphone. Then in 1954 the well-known M221 was presented. Here we already have the diameter of 20 millimeters, which then or already uh, also is occurring nowadays with the Colette series. And um, this step uh, has been possible because the tube again was smaller and uh, for the first time Schoeps here built its own miniaturized output transformers in order to fit that small housing. An important um, 
parameter of miniaturization is modularity because the trick that you place microphone and amplifier separately from each other makes essentially the visible part of the microphone very small. And that uh, was done for the first time with this series. It's the CMMT series that was sold exclusively in France in 1966 and the following years. Uh, you see in the picture that you have an uh, active extension cable that you can put in between the capsule and the amplifier. And as this series was exclusively sold in France in that time, uh, we um, know nowadays that a couple of years after the introduction of the series, it got a nickname. It was a French name and it then was also called Colette. And that was only a few years before the official launch of nowadays Colette system in 1973. Now not only active extension cables existed for this system, but also uh, tubes, active tubes, goosenecks and other elements. So that was the birth of a system which still is uh, sold today, which is modernized and expanded today and forms the core of our products nowadays. And actually today we are launching another component of the Colette system. But more about that in a minute. In 1994 then an important step was done by miniaturizing the electronics a lot. Now they could be uh, placed in the microphone housing with the birth of the CCM series in 1994. The system now is not modular anymore and uh, it also still exists nowadays as the smallest uh, microphone available. Then in 2016, these miniaturized electronics were also brought to our shotgun series of microphones. You know the famous Seam IT-5, of course, and the mini Seam IT is the, using the same capsule, but now with the miniaturized electronics. One further step of miniaturization was taken uh, only recently with the newly introduced CMC1U. Um, our primary product line, the Colette series, became available in a miniaturized form. And uh, today we will show that we can even get smaller because we are launching the CMC1L, which uses the same electronics, the CMC1 miniaturized electronics, but now we get smaller by using the small limo connector and we get a microphone that is only one inch and one ounce. So we are now able to build a modular microphone of the Colette series, which is as small as a CCM compact microphone. But more about that later. Let me show again uh, the microphones in uh, a size comparison. Uh, here is the microphone from 1950, the CM-V52. Here we have the CM-51.3, the M201, the M221, the Colette series, the CCM series, the CMC-1, also Colette series, but miniaturized, and today's product, the CMC-1L, here equipped with an MK-41. So why do we miniaturize at all at CHIPS? Essentially, there are two major arguments for that. It's the easier handling of smaller microphones, of course. And, and as you see that here in that picture, in particular, in particular at the end of a boom, 
It matters a lot whether or not the microphone is lightweight and small. And of course also the improved visual compatibility of the microphone is a major point here. Uh, anyway, that's a core topic of our company because we wouldn't be a standard in all these concert halls if we wouldn't have made this development to make small and elegant microphones which can be nicely concealed within a concert hall environment or on a film set. And um, also uh, when you're thinking of hanging microphones, uh, we are uh, building microphones for uh, parliaments, for example, where uh, large quantities of small microphones uh, are hanging from the ceiling and uh, served there to record the members of the parliament. Why can we miniaturize? Of course, um, miniaturization was possible because of a major technological progress, which was done in the last decades. First of all, of course, smaller electronic components. As you see it here in a picture, this small component SMD uh, technique um, replaces an element that was uh, much larger before, of course. Uh, then, of course, uh, miniaturization can not be done without an automated assembly of circuitry boards. Um, the discrete hand assembly of circuitry boards is not possible anymore with that size of elements. And um, also the circuit board technologies like rigid flex or multi-layer techniques got much more common within the last decades and much cheaper as well. So we can make use of them now also for our microphones. Um, and also, as you see it uh, in that picture, that actually is an IC, so an integrated circuitry. And uh, these got much better in the recent years and they replace large parts of former circuitry boards. So, of course, uh, by using them, it's possible to get uh, smaller microphones. Last not least, it's our know-how, which gained a lot in the last decades and um, it's uh, really decisive uh, how to um, make the circuitry boards and how to um, optimize the layout here because in the microphone you have various different uh, elements and sometimes they disturb each other so you really have to care about how and where to place them. So here's a lineup of the microphone electronics of four generations of uh, Schoeps microphones. Um, you see on the right side, um, the um, uh, once again, the CMV50 from uh, the 50s. So all these discrete elements with the tubes and the output transformer. And uh, you can see the CMC5. So um, this was built um, in 1973 when the Colette system was launched. Also discrete elements, hand assembled, of course. Then the next generation was launched in 1991 with the CMC6. Uh, in the meantime, of course, also SMD mounted uh, devices, um, automatic assembly, but the same form factor still. But then in uh, 2019, the CMC1U with the rigid flex technology and again a major step of miniaturization. The CMC1 um, not only is smaller than its predecessor, but we were also able to improve some um, uh, parameters of the um, amplifier and uh, that was made possible 
by all these uh, technological steps that I just mentioned. We achieved a very low current consumption of uh, 2 milliamps. We achieved a high maximum sound pressure level of uh, 135 uh, dB SPL. And what is very important, uh, we are using uh, the Schoeps RFI shield um, because we see um, that these miniaturized microphones are used a lot in combination with uh, wireless transmitter or even nowadays digital wireless transmitters, uh, which output high energy of RF. Uh, and of course, this dis could disturb the microphone a lot. And uh, the CMC1U and also the CMC1L uh, was tested uh, with a couple of transmitters uh, successfully tested. Um, as for example, the Audio Limited A10. And also parameters like the uh, low output impedance and the common mode reject uh, rejection ratio were improved in the CMC1. Uh, again, here's a lineup of our Colette amplifiers. Uh, from left to right, it's the CMC6, the CMC1, uh, the CMC1. Uh, U with the XLR output and L with the LEMO output. For comparison reasons, there is the CCM41 here and its Colette brother, the CMC1L, equipped with an MK41. On the right side of this slide, you can see that uh, the CMC1 will also be available in a version with a permanently attached cable, uh, which we call CMC1. K. The CMC1 uh, really is a milestone in the history of Schoeps and we are quite uh, proud of that. Um, the CMC1U was presented already in uh, 2019, in October of last year, and has already become one of our most successful products now. So by the um, application of the CMC1L now, we further can reduce the size. And uh, what is very important in the case of the CMC1L is that from day one, it is one of our most flexi fle flexible and versatile microphones, because it not only is compatible with all accessories of the CCM series, but also with all components of the Colette series. So it is one of the most flexible products that we ever made. And in this picture, you already see some possible applications. Um, the use together with a digital wireless transmitter like the A10, uh, as we mentioned before. Um, due to the fact that it is compatible with the CCM series, of course, we can use it with a with an existing suspension like the Minix or with a new suspension that Cinella just presented like the O6, which is dedicated for the CMC1L uh, in combination with a Cut60. And also in the concert hall, of course, the CMC1L will be found. Uh, in this example, we are using an RC tube and an MK4 to show it to you. Well, um, the CMC1L is available as of now uh, at a price of 729 euro or 919 dollars. Uh, it comes with a 5 meter cable adaptation from LEMO 2 XLR output and a miniature stand adapter that holds the microphone by the 8 millimeter LEMO connector safely. Thank you for your attention and have a lot of fun with all the other presentations now. Thanks. Welcome back to our live stream. We're joined now by Helmut from Ships Microphones. Welcome. Hello, Kim. Nice to, uh, for having me. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to have you. And, and the, the place that you're in looks just incredible. I've said that to you already, but maybe you can tell everyone where you are. Well, actually, we are here in the catacombs of our company building, and we have just built this brand new video studio. Uh, the building actually is from the 17th century where we're in here. 
Wow. Uh, we thought we have to transmit that together with our uh, 70 years uh, yes. of, uh, of um, product history. We yes. have to transport uh, some of the emotions that we have here. Yes, I love microphone. that. The contrast of the, the new and old. That's so beautiful. Well, I think we have some questions for you right off the bat here. People are eager to talk about this product. So uh, let's see our first question. How do we manage to make a microphone that small? Well, uh, it is a question of a couple of years of development. We have uh, done that topic of miniaturization, as you see, for the last decades. And just in the during the last years, we managed to uh, get new technologies running. Uh, first uh, approach was the CCM, where we placed the electronics, and then the mini CMIT, where we practiced miniaturization, uh, so to say, and uh, could uh, successfully miniaturize. And uh, all in uh, all together, it's a teamwork. We, we learned a lot. We have different uh, people in our wonderful team here uh, that, uh, that came together with their ideas. And in the end, that was the result then. Lovely. Well, what a great result it is. <laughs> Let's take the next question. Uh, someone is asking, what does it mean for the existing CCM series? Well, um, I don't know uh, what that means in the far future. Of course, we will uh, go on uh, with offering the CCM at the moment, but as it is very uh, similar to the CMC1L and an MK, um, I am excited as well, and I'm curious what will happen in the future. Um, Me too. We have a couple of uh, amplifiers, uh, and the people very much like to be flexible and change capsules and use different amplifiers for different applications. So uh, it has always been the Colette series that was most successful. And also we will have a very exciting new amplifier even mm -hmm. within the next couple of weeks. We are starting then a beta test, so stay tuned for that as well. Ooh, that's so exciting. all together, modularity makes sense, but also the CCM series has its applications, of course. That's awesome. And where can people look out for that announcement on the new product? Yes. So yeah, maybe... well, yes, the, um, uh, we will uh, we will uh, transport that via our channels. So we're just in the Great. midst of preparations for the uh, for the presentation. So it will be on our on our channels and on YouTube very soon. Awesome. So look out for that, guys. Follow Sheps on on Instagram and all that and look out for the new announcement. Thank you so much, Helmut. This has been really fun talking Thank with you. you. Have yeah, a great have a lot of fun with all the presentations. <laughs> we will have a great evening. All right, let's move it right along. Our next presentation is from WYSICOM. For more than 30 years, WYSICOM has focused on innovation and the highest quality. WYSICOM's team of engineers designed the most sophisticated RF solutions for microphones, IFB, IEM, RF distribution systems, and more using the latest and most advanced technology available. Based in Northern Italy, WYSICOM is recognized as one of the main players in the worldwide market of audio equipment for broadcast, live, and location sound applications. Hey, I'm Jeff, product specialist with WYSICOM. We are so excited to be with you here in this virtual space until a time that we can see you in person. Over the next few minutes, you'll hear from some of our team on developments we have made over the last few months and the last year. A few things you may already know and a few announcements. First, WYSICOM Manager. WYSICOM Manager 3.0 will soon be released both on our website in the United States and across the world. This Windows-based software will give you the ability to manage all of your WYSICOM devices in one compact platform. The most notable addition to 3.0 from previous versions is the compatibility with our portable transmitters, the body packs, handhelds, and plug-on transmitters. Using WYSICOM Manager 3.0, you can create and edit the WYSICOM frequency memory files, what we call our WDF charts. WDF is a powerful resource under the hood of your WYSICOM device to create, plan, and share frequency files throughout the world straight from your laptop, as well as update the firmware to get all the powerful features added to your WYSICOM devices. 
While we are talking about our portable transmitters, personally, one of the things I am most excited to announce is the modifications we are making to our transmitters. As our world is constantly evolving, so is WYSIWYGON. So as ultrasonic motion sensors become more and more common in our world, where we work and where we live, our transmitters needed to evolve as well. For this, we developed a hardware solution, and I've invited one of our engineers from the factory in Italy to tell you a little more about it. Ciao to everyone, I'm Dennis, a RF engineer at Visicom and the Quarter in Italy. I'd like to tell you more about a new hardware revision of our portable transmitters. We introduced new audio filter to help protect our units from a massive ultrasound interference generated by a different devices. Just to make an example, the new generation of camera range trackers can release on ultrasonic audio of about 130 dB SPL the same as the camera, so to speak. This could affect massively our daily job while on set. And just in order to avoid this kind of problem, we introduced a dedicated low-pass filter that can reject up to 70 dB to allow the two user to work without any kind of issue in most polluted ultrasonic environment. Earlier this year, we announced Symphony, which is the culmination of all the key features that make WYSICOM unique. Part of Symphony is the MCR54, with the added functionality of high-density narrowband to get incredibly compact carriers every 200 kilohertz across the available spectrum. In the development of the ultrasonic modification, we were able to adapt the capabilities of our portable transmitters and enhance the firmware to allow the transmitter modulation to be switchable on the unit. So you can choose in real time to have either standard wideband modulation or high density narrowband. This brings advantages to any type of production. I've invited Leslie Lello from our factory to share more about this powerful development. Thanks, Jeff, and hello to everyone. The continuous shrinking spectrum has given us the opportunity to find new solutions and face the upcoming problems related to noise, interferences, and reduced working bandwidth. The new technology we introduced, as said before, allow us to smoothly and easily switch our modulation type from the standard wideband to the high-density narrowband in order to decrease massively our band occupation by 50%. One of the main advantages of working with physical narrowband technology is an increased receiving sensitivity of 3 dB, which translates into 50% more coverage, or twice the power. This means that a 100 mW carrier will be effective as it is a 200 mW one. All of this without affecting the audio quality. On this spectrum analyzer, we're receiving six carriers, three in wideband and three in narrowband. You can clearly see how clean the spectrum is and that the occupation bandwidth is less than half. All WYSICOM transmitters will be shipping with these new modifications. We did not stop there though. For all of our current WYSICOM users, you will be able to send in your transmitters to us for this upgrade. To find out if your transmitters are eligible and to get started with this upgrade, go to wysicomusa.com slash TX upgrade and follow the steps. Finally, let's talk about the WYSICOM roadmap. These are some of the products and features currently in development. First, we have been listening to the feedback from everyone using the MCR54, and we are currently working to develop the next generation of firmware for the MCR54. This will include a new screen layout, along with a truly powerful feature for scanning and automatically selecting the frequencies for your MCR54. Next, the MRK16, a sound card's dream. With four available slots for the MCR54, get 16 channels of wireless in one rack unit. The MRK16 has built-in connectivity for the antennas, so it's truly plug and play. Once connected, the MRK16 can control our entire line of smart antenna products from the LFA to the BFA and the ADFA. The MRK16 offers analog AES3 and Dante outputs. Finally, we'd like to tell you about the RPU500. For this, I've invited Massimo Polo to share some of the features. Hi, I'm Massimo. I'm here to show you the products Wizicon is brought to the market during the last part of 2020 that doesn't belong to Location Sound. Those are mainly brought as products, but we want to show you the technology we implement in those products because we soon will bring this technology to the Location Sound market. The first product I want to talk about is the RPU500. This unit is a reportage unit, which is basically 
a one watt power uh, transmitter which is using what we call that the multiband RF, which is basically the possibility of working in ultra wide band uh, frequency. So this transmitter is able to tune between 174 and 960 megahertz smoothly, which is basically all available bandwidth in the United States. Another nice feature of this transmitter is that it has an integrated IFB. So basically the, the journalist has the possibility of pushing four buttons We're using the standard Amber Plus protocol. So basically we can ma make a, into the mixer all the routing tables. The way when you push a button, you can address the right place and you can have the right feedback. This device is being just deployed to the MotoGP. I was there a couple of weeks ago and actually there is an implementation there where pushing a button, a journalist can talk with our people in France. So basically it's generate with the button an Ember Plus uh, control that actually makes the level mixer to call the, their, their people in France and set up the connectivity. Another product I want to talk about is actually the expansion board for Marquina Eri, which is our top of the range receiver. So basically this is a Marquina Eri. And on the back of the units, there is a small slot where you can put actually the board. The idea, we've been running RF over fiber since 10 years, uh, running the biggest show in the world. Now we come to the concept that we can put this connectivity directly into the receiver. In this way, we can use all the electronics, the intelligence, and also the connectivity of the receiver so we can reduce the costs and also increase the easiness of the usage because you have only one device to manage. Another thing that I want to show, for instance, so basically this is a, a rack that is able to host uh, four receivers. So actually, it is actually a 16 channel rack that can be host the same board that we already designed and deliver for the Marquina 80. Here you can see very close the solution it does look like. So there is a slot where it can be inserted the expansion board. In this way, you can lever all the capability of this device, which is a very powerful ARM processor and a very nice connectivity, both fiber and ethernet, in order to remote and control all your fiber. As Wizicon, we are continuously developing new technology for the high ends. And of course, it's important to show that all these technology that, for instance, they use daily into the Formula One, the MotoGP, sooner or later, they will be brought to location site. For more information about anything we've talked about here, please ask questions in the comment box below or check out wizicomusa.com. Welcome back to the Sound Summit live stream. Today we're joined by two members of the WYSICOM team. We're very lucky to have both of you here. We have Marika, who's in Northern Italy, and Jeff, who is in Virginia. Is that right, Jeff? Yeah, yeah, we have a Virginia or US office based out of Alexandria, Virginia. For awesome. anyone not around here, it's about 20 minutes south of uh, Washington, DC. Cool, well, welcome to both of you. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> Thank you for having us. We've had a lot of questions already in the comments. Shall we just jump right in? Yeah, absolutely. All right, sounds good. So our first question, someone wants to know the difference between transmitters with the ultrasonic mods. So the ultrasonic mod is something we kind of touched on here and it's, you know, we added a hardware filter because we know ultrasonic is becoming more and more of an issue. And, you know, it, it creates a lot of problems with the companion and audio circuitry. So what you'll see on your transmitters, and I have a disassembled MTP here, under your model number, you'll see an option code, which is OPT colon and a bunch of letters and numbers. All of these things mean something, but what you're looking for to find if you have a new one is UN, which is ultrasonic narrowband, and then NB near the end, which has the narrowband switchable filters. Mm. Cool, thank you so much. All right, so Ken Goodwin is asking, um, will the new ultrasonic filter work with Cinetape or other camera focus tools? Yeah, yeah, the, our, our testing and all of our factor and R&D is determined this is gonna bring down the ultrasonic, everything you know above about 20K up, it will reduce all that by about 70 dB. So that should prove to be no real issue for uh, any of the Cinetape focus poles or anything like that. 
All right, thank you for clarifying. We have another question from SoundSpeed uh, who is asking, when will a remote be available? And it's a, uh, they look like they, they see the Bluetooth 5 mentioned for control. So Bluetooth 5 is something we introduced on the MCR54. And you know, in, in our next gen of transmitters, we're going to add that for those. But for now, we have added it to the MCR54. And very soon, we will have an app coming out to remote control your MCR54. And this will work with the new firmware we're going to release that will allow you to scan and your MCR54 to automatically select the frequencies for you. That's wonderful. Thank you, Jeff, so much for clarifying all of that. Marika, you've been so quiet over there. We haven't even given you a chance to speak. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> thanks, thanks so much for this opportunity. Anyway, I would like to thank you so much. Anyway, uh, let's say that it's important also to give a view of how things are going in Vesico, you know. We have been quite busy in the last month uh, working on new projects. Uh, and uh, anyway, we are planning also to launch new products in the future. So let's say that... Uh, Nowadays, we are very, very busy. We are facing high demands of the new products that we launched recently, like the MCR54, like the new transmitter, and all products dedicated to low location sound, also broadcast. So let's say that uh, um, we enjoy a lot in this period. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, we, we have now this new transmitter that uh, we already delivered in all Europe. And as Jeff knows, we already delivered also a batch in the US and uh, we have a worldwide request on this. Uh, so we are trying to manage as best as we can the deliveries, you know? So yeah. anyway, uh, the, also in the, in the next uh, weeks, uh, we will deliver it to US, this uh, new transmitter. And anyway, we try to satisfy all the demand. That's Let's say great. that we are satisfied of the launch of the new products and uh, we're working anyway to to satisfy everybody <laughs> that's great yeah. to hear and and you mentioned new yeah. products coming soon so maybe we can drop some yeah. links in the comments here on the video your website social media things like that so people can follow you and watch out yeah. for those new announcements yeah some announcement has been given by massimo we're working on the mrk 16 that for location sound will be a great opportunity and uh, anyway we will keep uh, all people informed on our web on social media and unfortunately there are no exhibition at the moment, mm, but yeah. uh, we have a social media that is helping a lot and uh, we will be active there or, or through our website anyway. Sounds good. Thank you guys yeah. so much, Jeff and Marika from WYSICOM. I think we're going to move on to our next presentation and let you guys go and enjoy your day. Oh, All right. Thank thanks you. so much. All right. Thank, Thank you both <laughs> so much. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. All right. Up next, we have two presentations from Ambient. Hello, I'm Klaus with Ambient. Welcome to Sound Summit Fall 2020. And today I'm gonna to show you what we've been cooking up since the spring event. So one thing is we recently discontinued the Master Locket and Master Locket Plus. And some of you might have been wondering what we would be coming up with next. So there's a lot of speculation being going on if it would be the power locket that we've been teasing now for a while, but down the road it turned out it would be too complicated, too expensive and too special. So we took a step back, scratched our heads, and came up with the Locket Plus. It's not ready for market yet, so I beg you a couple of months more patience, but it is advanced enough to today show you the exciting features of our upcoming flagship. Okay, so what's the Plus? The original Master Locket Plus was named so because the extra feature of lens data recording, and of course the Locket Plus has this feature as well, but it has so many more. With simultaneous output for SEMTI, MIDI timecode, GenLock, word clock, pulse per frame, dedicated serial interfaces for recorders, cameras, and lenses. It is the most versatile unit we ever built. So that's a huge plus already, but that's not even all. But plus also because we designed it as a fully modular concept. So in fact, it's Locket plus something. And this something is what we call tails. And depending on the tail, you will see varying interconnections, but it also tick configuration boxes for you to help you to tame the flood of possibilities. These tales will be released by and by. And in order of appearance and of course of utmost interest for you sound mixers, welcome the Tonemeister tale. So what do you care about video sync and lens data, right? So when you put this on, it will pre-select word clock as a sync format. It will enable the recorder control function in, in the web interface. 
It has sideway outlets, so you can put it in a bag without jamming the cables. On one side, you have the power input and timecode and metadata control for your recorder. On the other side, you have triple USB for powering, MIDI timecode, and data transmission. So basically, the master locket as you knew it, if you only knew. It becomes a bit more tricky when it comes to the super slot tail, which is a standard that is now found on cameras and recorders alike. As timecode and sync are actually part of the super slot standard, no external cabling are required when used on units with full implementation. But super slot is so much more. We have learned to know and love what sound devices in Arton have achieved by communicating with receivers that support that standard. It's technically not 100% correct, but for the moment, let's look at ACN being a timecode radio link that now can become an integral part of your recorder's interface. And then there's metadata, which has been an essential piece of the ACN when we introduced it almost 10 years ago. So think of what we have achieved down the road by transmitting additional information derived over serial connection. And guess what? A serial connection is part of SuperSlot too. So why not embrace this? Make our API available over this connection and allow recorders to become mission control for timecode and metadata. But as said, it also works on cameras. And in case it is not a super slot camera, you can easily tap timecode and genlock on top of the unit itself. And in case there is no slot in on the camera, there will be camera tails. And this is where the true power of the unit becomes unleashed. While super slot has 25 pins, the edge connector in the unit quadruples this count. So we have anywhere to go from compact sandwich plates topping out with what we've been showing with the power locket concept. The most versatility, however, will be found in the studio tail. Less a tail than a rack mount intended for DITs, video villages, OB vans, studios, and of course, these over-the-top sound cards. When put into this, the Locket Plus transforms into a full ACN studio master clock with multiple parallel buffered outputs for timecode, word clock, genlock, and PPF. So we have seen where this unit may go. Now let's look how to operate it. First of all, it has the physical interface from our locket, which lets you initiate a sync from the internal real-time clock in the morning with a single press of a button. But you don't even have to do that when you tick the auto start box, because then it will resume on either real-time clock, real-time clock minus 12 hours, or a fixed selectable value once you apply power. Let's move on to the ACN tab. All the way up, you have configuration for your local device, including sync settings, ACN channel, and CJ master. Underneath, you have the ACN radar that shows all devices on the same channel. We paid careful attention to allow from smallest to largest setups without sacrificing control. Introduced last year, we have the Slate tab, which also has seen a major overhaul. It only gives success to those fields that need to be managed by the clapper loader during a typical shooting day. It wouldn't be a Locket Plus without lens data recording. We're happy to say that we closely cooperated with Cook to implement the latest version of their standard and now allow for frame accurate recording of all the data, including inertia data, essential for VFX. When I say the Locket Plus would maintain all the features of the former Master Locket, this naturally holds true for remote control for sound devices 788T and 6 Series. Nothing new and fancy here, but the new interface, still we know some of you would have been largely disappointed if we wouldn't have included it. So what about new recorders? Sorry, no. Simply because the variances are too diverse to do this close to justice. So instead, we thought of a unique feature that currently no other standalone device has and will bring you exceptional added value. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome the first mobile frequency coordinator. Yes, that's right, using a simple USB stick the Locket Plus will help you to manage the challenges of arranging complex multi-channel radio systems on set. And it's completely autonomous. While some manufacturers offer utilities to run on a computer, this coordination works with no installation right out of the box on any device with Wi-Fi. It's not limited to a single brand or band of radios and spans the whole spectrum. So how does this work? Step one, you enter your equipment list. Create blocks of devices using the same frequency band and stepping. Step two, 
Arrange your local configuration. Which systems are you going to use on that project? Step 3. Run a full spectrum scan of the local area. Step 4. You will receive a frequency coordination table for all the active systems. If you have problems, rescan with the system running. You can lock or re-coordinate single frequencies or can add new systems to your setup. This all will come included with that USB stick in the Tonemeister tail, but also in the future be part of our SuperSlot API. So hopefully in the future we will see recorders doing a frequency coordination using our system. Closed Beta is going to start later this year and the feature will be made available in Spring 21 along with the Locket Plus. So that's our contribution for the Sound Summit Fall 2020. Thanks for watching. Hello, I'm Klaus with Ambient and welcome to Sound Summit Fall 2020. Since now three years, our NanoLocket has become known and appreciated as a reliable and compact timecode generator. But we're excited to announce yet another use case that will especially please directors, video journalists, and documentary filmmakers, which is live logging on set. So you see, this is not our typical clientele. So we went out and did a little crowdfunding on Kickstarter if this would work out. And right now, as we shoot this video, the campaign is already at 90%. So you know us, we are obsessed, we will see this through. So, but for those that are looking forward to use the Nano Locket in its standard way as a sync generator, don't be concerned, nothing will change. In fact, the logging is already implemented in the actual firmware. So what is it all about then? Basically, it's about pressing the green button to mark a good take and pressing the red button to mark a bad take or any markers in between while you're shooting. Later on, you can extract them with the toolbox and ingest them into your editing tool in post. So, but what am I saying actually? I mean, our very own production company did a wonderful video for our Kickstarter campaign, so I leave it to that. Thanks, Klaus, and hello to the Sound Summit. As a director, I usually already know on set which takes were good and which were bad. Ah! And cut! That was wonderful, darling. But we're gonna have to do it once again. That's why it's annoying that I have to click through all the raw material again in the editing. Here's the solution. The Nano Locket with live logging function. If I see great acting, I press the green button. If the take was not that good, the red one. It's just that simple. In the post, I can now import these markers into my editing tool and my clips get automatically labeled green and red. Want to see that again? With this, I can immediately sort by good and bad clips and see the markers from set right in my timeline. And now, ask Klaus anything about the new live logging function of the Nano Locket. Welcome back to our live stream. We're joined now by Klaus from Ambient. You're in Munich, Germany, is that correct? I am. Hello, Kim. How are Hello. you doing today? Hello. Very well. It's so great to have you here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, the videos looked wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to go... Oh, what's that? Things. Yeah, we've been quite busy doing that, actually, as you can imagine. It looked amazing. The result was well worth the effort. <laughs> I'm going to jump right in. We have a question here regarding batteries. Someone's wondering, can the unit run on batteries? Yes, it can. I mean, that was one of the, the things we learned uh, with the predecessor, the master locket, that people were planning to use that on battery and it only had a backup solution for that. So this time we don't have one battery. We have two batteries of the BX1 style, which is... Uh, slightly thicker than the NP50, but has a lot more capacity. And the usefulness having two and they are accessible from the outside is that you can swip swap them. So you can rotate and, and keep the unit going without ha um, having external power. Although I must say with the possibilities to use USB power as well as the regular 12 volts, uh, we have all the options covered ba basically for independent autonomous use. Yeah, that is really cool. We have another question from Dan Newburn. He's asking, um, what editors is the logging compatible with? Um, so we 
actually we didn't know we had this in mind for quite a while actually this is the reason why we shipped the nano locket with the lanyard from day one so this been going an idea quite a while around in our heads um so um still we don't know but what we found is the people using or looking into that mostly work on adobe premiere so this will mm. be the first plugin or panel that we do to import those markers um, on from then, I think the next step would be Final Cut because it's more like for, for video journalists, documentary, and they don't use the larger tools of the film industry. Um, still, if we find a way to make it into Avid, of course, this can be a contribution to a professional's uh, setup as well. But we Very start cool. with Premiere and then we'll see uh, Final Cut X uh, Pro is definitely on our radar. Very cool. All right. We have one last question here from Ken Goodwin. He's asking, can the frequency spectrum scan be exported as a CSV file? Actually, um, we could think into, look into that. It's not planned yet. So the it's an internal thing that is built on, on, on the web interface. And we also preparing to communicate that over the super slot protocol over serial. So basically that uh, we can either scan directly receivers through the super subtle interface, which is possible as we all know by now, but also that a recorder scans all the receivers in the slots and then loads up a frequency table and we do the calculation. But the CSV file, I mean, we're always listening to our customers and users and uh, if it sounds reasonable, we will definitely do it. Great, well, thank you so much, Klaus, for joining us live and answering these questions. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. And you. we're going to continue on with our next presentation from DPA. Being a sound engineer in film production and TV production is a very important role. However, when a lot of people are talking to you on set, it frequently means that there is a problem with the sound. There are many elements to sound. There's placing microphones, hiding them, working with the wardrobe department having a backup system in case there's unwanted noise in the transmission, maintaining a clean wireless system, keeping daily notes, cleaning equipment, maintaining synchronization with all cameras. These are just a few elements that sound engineers need to deal with in this environment. And above all of these elements is the accuracy and natural sound that is needed for such productions. Intelligibility is our ability to understand each other as humans. So properly placing the microphone and having a signal chain that could accurately reproduce speech is a welcome friend to any sound engineer on set. It also saves time and money if the field take is the final take. DPA Microphones makes a variety of microphones for different applications. Microphones that are meant to be hidden under the clothes. Microphones that are meant to be planted so that the scene can be filmed with no microphones visible at all and no chance of having someone grab the microphone or hinder the performer's body motions in any way. Sound is invisible, and the implementation of capturing sound needs to be invisible as well. It is what makes or breaks a successful production. It doesn't matter how pretty the pictures are. If we cannot hear the environment and understand what is spoken, it leaves us without the information that is intended. My name is Gabriel Antonini. I'm the Business Development Manager for DPA Microphones in the U.S. Today we're going to do a brief overview of DPA's 6000 series Omni lavaliers and headsets. Let's get right to it. Let's look at the 6060 and 6061 first. They are both 3 millimeters in size but have the same self noise as our larger 5 millimeter body worn mics. This means you get a smaller mic without the added noise that typically gets added when the microphones get smaller. The 6060 is capable of 134 dB SPL and the 61 at 144 dB SPL. We recommend using the 6060 when you are working with spoken word or acoustic instruments as it captures the nuances much better. The 6061 when you expect steady louder sources like explosions or screams or loud instruments like brass or drums. Because of the DPA core technology, these mics also have an extended dynamic range allowing for great levels before clipping in both models. So rest assured, they will not distort during your show. The core also brings an IP58 durability rating which provides extreme resistance to water immersion and dust. 
They are also compatible with most third-party wireless systems worldwide and can also be used wired in an XLR connection. The 6000 series microphone is also fantastic for instrument intelligibility. Let's listen to a piano recording. As if it couldn't get any better, we've added another feature. A white painted sturdy stainless steel cap. This can be painted or covered in makeup to customize your production. So you can now change the colors on all of the caps. It also retains the IP58 rating whether you use the original cap that came with the microphone or you get this cap. It's called a DUA9302 paintable sub miniature cap. It's always been important to disinfect microphones on set, but nowadays, let's face it, it's probably one of the most important items that everyone is talking about. DPA created a video on the website to show step-by-step -step on how to do this for our omni and directional microphones. Just remember that you need demineralized water only, no cleaning fluids. Just take apart the windscreen, remove the cap, get everything separated, clean it briskly in the demineralized water, let it sit to dry for 72 hours and then go back to the set and make movie magic. Probably a good idea to keep the mics in rotation so that while one group is drying, you have another group that's ready to go back to work. As you can see in this video, it's not often that you get two wrenches and tug a microphone. But what we are trying to say here is that durability sometimes gets misrepresented. True toughness comes from consistent performance after daily use. Not that you would tug at your mic cable like this in the video, but it is very durable as you can see. Increased strain relief, IP58 rating for the capsule, Kevlar reinforced cable, and a higher dynamic range. Although this video is about the 6000 series, I have to mention the 4560, which is our new binaural headset microphone, which is comprised of two 4060 capsules matched in sensitivity, as close as we can get them, and basically perfect for binaural recording. So great for, for recording cues for film sets, for theater, and just about anywhere the imagination can go. It truly brings a unique perspective, a 3D spatial experience to headphones, and with a bit of an EQ curve, you can also play back through conventional speakers. Quick look at the 6066, which I'm wearing right now. This headset has all the same attributes as the 6061 regarding 144 dB SPL handling and the core technology, which has extended dynamic range and IP58 rating for extreme resistance to water and dust. It also has multiple points of adjustment not seen before in any headset on the market. The boom arm can be adjusted up or down, front to rear. The wiring harness can be relocated in order to be more camera friendly. A great solution for church, pastor, broadcaster, or theater applications. So, if you're looking for premium intelligibility for a body-worn lavalier or a headset, look no further. And with a two-year warranty, it's a no-brainer. This video was made through a DPA MMA-A interface into an iPhone with no EQ or processing. Thanks for watching. I'll stick around for some questions. Welcome back to our live stream. We have Gabriel with us from DPA. Thanks for joining us, Gabriel. You're very welcome, Kim. Thanks for having me. I was looking at the, the presentation and the video looked awesome. The, the, the painting image was one of my favorites. We actually have a question uh, right away regarding that. Can they be colored? Yes, they can be colored. You could use makeup on them. You could use coloring on them. And it's a, it's a brand new product. The coolest thing about it is that you don't lose the IP58 rating from the capsule that comes with the microphone. So if you decide to purchase oh. those paintable capsules, you also retain all of the, uh, all of the core technology in the IP58. That's good to know. Yep. 
All right, another question we have is, what is the best way to match the boom with the body-worn microphone? That's a good question. Oh, interesting. Cool. You know what? Let me grab a slide and, and we could talk about that because that's something that's extremely important. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. Yeah, I want to show you. Can everyone see that? Let's see. I, I don't see anything yet. What about you guys? Okay, hold on. Uh, Let me try again here. I know why. Okay. Here we go. And there we go. All right. Go there Ooh. and we'll go there. Look at that. How's that? Is that better? That's much better. Why awesome. they play so, nice together. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, great. So, I mean, there's obviously a difference here in, in the physical form and, the, and the, the patterns. One is an omni microphone. And we can see on the left, it's very true. At zero axis, it's, it's completely good at all frequencies. As, as, and on these are less prone to proximity, less prone to wind noise. So they're great for the body worn. They pick up just enough of the environment to really give the natural feel. What we see in the back of the microphone to the sides that the higher frequencies are becoming a little more directional uh, in, the, in the 16, 20, 8K range. Mm -hmm. And if we see on the, on the right side, we see the 4017, which one of my coworkers uh, covered, I think yesterday. And we could see that as a traditional shotgun, it becomes a little directional as well on the higher frequencies. But the higher frequencies are sort of what shoot down the barrel and give us that focus and that intelligibility. So if you're doing a location shot, you know, and someone grabs their chest or, or, or a big wind takes over the boom microphone because that's going to be more prone to wind, you know, the equalizer here is that this off access chart on the bottom here shows that all angles are, are, are somewhat linear all the way across. They do not cross anywhere. If they crossed anywhere, it would become an omni at that frequency. So the omni plays well with the directional when you could sort of get the distance that exudes no proximity effect. Or, you know, sometimes in the field, you have to sort of get what you get. But if you, this microphone set, I think at 26 inches to exhibit no proximity. So let's just say you, you have the luxury to sort of like be within that range somewhere. If you cut from the Omni to that microphone, you will have an Omni-like sound with the directional because of this linearity off axis and with no proximity effect, it'll cut very nicely with, with the Omni microphone. There you go. Oh, that was really interesting. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I feel like and I really know how to explain that now. <laughs> <laughs> let's, um, let's see. Do you want to move on to your next yeah, slide? Do you have another could, slide? I, yeah, I do. I have a few actually. I'll run let's through. Let's look through those. I'd love that. If you have a question, just interrupt me because I love to be interrupted. I, I mean, will. All right. I really, really do. <laughs> um, so we have some key features of the 6061, 6000 series uh, miniature microphone. Clear sound, obviously. Metal housing, PVD coating. Sorry if I'm reading this all. It's just a habit. That's um, okay. Kevlar reinforced cable, which really goes a long way in the field. And a durable cable relief. Sleek design. Easy to hide. Small footprint without the sonic compromises. And then secondly, we have the core technology by DPA, which we can discuss uh, in the next slide or two. Removable cap. And now we have, we have the windscreen and we have a future windscreen coming out and we have a paintable cap, which you've seen. And you can see the size difference between the, the 4000 series lavalier and, and the new uh, 6000 series. It's two millimeters smaller, so 60% smaller. There's the math if you want to do it, right? 60% smaller, but the same noise floor, the same self noise, pardon me. So that's a big deal if you're, if you have a lot of microphones on set that all have the same self noise, whether you need to use the 4061 or the 6061. And that is what it is in our US term, 0 0.21 inches or 0 0.133 inches, pretty small. And you can also see if, if people understand what the 1% THD is, it's, it's the point at where harmonic distortion begins. So the core technology versus the legacy technology, we see yet the THD comes in at 1% at 123. And we see with the core technology, it comes in at 137. So we've managed to push your dynamic range way up, which is a big deal if you're going for a 6060 or a 6061. They're different SPL handling. So to know that the speech uh, model, which is the 6060, can have more headroom, is, is, it, really, it really gives you confidence. You're on set and somebody's going to scream. You don't want to hinder the actors. You want them to be expressive and you want them to be able to do their thing. So with the DPA mic, with this extended core, it's, it's awesome. And there's the 6000 series, and that's 137 as well, just like the 4061. So that's a big deal. An airplane engine's about 130 decibels, so it's... It's pretty good. And you can see in this picture from the, from the movie um, yesterday, which was a great movie. 
think we Simon a, Hayes mixed that one, right? That's correct. Very yes. good. Yes. Kim wins the prize. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> the 6,000 is buried under his t-shirt and the 4,000 mm. is inside the guitar. So oh, interesting. Did here. So everything you hear in that movie, Kim, is um, these two microphones, whether he's in front of 20,000 people from what I've been told or at any, at any scene in the movie. So Wow. And you could think that the 6,000 position there would pick up the beauty of the guitar, would pick mm. up the higher frequencies and, and sort of the air, his voice, and then the, the buried uh, microphone inside the guitar to give a little bit of the intimacy. So they're probably right. mixed at some point. Simon does his magic, but that's all you hear in that movie. Those two microphones. Wow, that is really yeah. cool. As a singer guitarist myself, I very much want to try that exact combination now. Well, give me an email. We'll make it I happen. will. Totally. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> totally. Um, the core technology obviously minimizes distortion, expands your dynamic range from 6 to 14 dB. It's extreme water and dust resistant, which is a real big deal for these microphones. And you know that. So basically, this is the nice difference of an old painting. I did this as kind of tongue in cheeky, but <laughs> the legacy is on the right. You can see that we have a great output, but we have a little bit of blur because harmonic distortion causes that. And I like this left, example. <laughs> we have the real deal. We have even more accuracy from our previous models. And this is sort of what it looks like on a chart. We can see where the 1% is kicking in and we can see where we pushed that dynamic range and the red indicates previous and post core technology. So we've got more dynamic range. It's a big deal. That is awesome. And for IP, just so you know, oops, go back one. IP rating, uh, the five is, is, is the protection, protection against dust. So, you know, particles that are larger than one millimeter. The second digit is, is the extreme resistance to uh, water, which this microphone can be immersed in one meter of water for seven hours or so. Oh, and wow. You, and you could just pull it out and it just works. So it's, it's fantastic for any scene where you're going to get a lot of wear and tear from the, from the environment. And you can see what this looks like on a chart dynamic range wise. We have 97 dB here from the legacy model. And now that's kind of what it looks like. You have that available extra headroom with the core technology. Oh, and this is the announcement. Might as well get to it, right? Oh, here we are. Yes. <laughs> Let's so, do it. Calling all film sound engineers. Um, we're doing, um, in collaboration with Rycote, we're doing a nice, um, I guess we'll call a competition. You, you submit your projects and you can get more information on this on our website by November 30th. Um, you get, you get some cool stuff and you get a one-on-one -on -one mentoring session with one of our master filmmakers. That is found. so fun. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, everyone, you know, within my voice, please go to the website and uh, check that out. Yeah. You know? We'll drop a link in the comments so you guys can follow up on that. That is that a would, really cool opportunity. That'd be great, Kim. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Yeah. And just a couple more slides to show you what, what the new painted cap looks like with the windscreen. We have mm. all the four finishes here that you can see, and then the painted cap on the, on the right and the windscreen. I, I, I'm, I believe there may be an, another windscreen coming out in the future. And then this is sort of the three different, you know, we have the 4060, the 4160, which is more of the slim uh, version, and then the 6000. We have the new double clip for the 6000 series. So you could double mic and you have an eight way positioning on that clip for double or single. I know this Ooh. was uh, this was really needed. And we, oh, we yeah, I needed that recently, actually. That's yeah. a beautiful clip. And there's the paint and there's the mm -hmm. cap. And, you know, there there is uh, this the MMA, which is a product we make for. Um... Oh, there's the end of the slideshow. Let me stop sharing. OK, all good. right. That, was, that great. was great. Thank you for sharing all of yeah. that with us. No, you're, you're so welcome. You're so welcome. Um, any more questions? Yeah, you know, you addressed this a little bit already. And I've had some experience with DPA mics myself using them out in, in just crazy conditions like the middle of the Mojave Desert in summer. Um, someone wants to know, how do these small mics hold up to extreme conditions? Well, um, I could just give you the short answer and tell you that they're going up to Mars on the rover. And, oh and my gosh. That's, that's, <laughs> so, that's the proof. All I right. guess not, not really <laughs> answering the question, but the R&D department at DPA is uh, fanatical uh, about really making sure these microphones look beautiful, sound beautiful, and for mo mostly the cabling, the integrity, the structural born noise, all of the things that could ruin your take yes. are dealt with. Yeah. Um, and that's from the mount to the sound. The temperature of the of the microphones, I believe, tops out at 113 Fahrenheit and goes down to, I believe, minus 40 okay. Fahrenheit. 
So that's a nice temperature swing and the cables got Kevlar reinforcement and uh, it's beautiful. And we also give really great instructions on how to care for the cables and the microphones yes. and how to clean them. Very in, in important. This day and age. Yeah. So that's all on there as well. I hope cool. I so, answered the question. Oh, I think you did. Where can people yeah. find that information? Like the instructions on how to clean it. Is that on your website? Yeah, we have a special video that we made and, and really good information on how to clean directional Omni because previously people... Um, we're under the belief that only Omni microphones could be cleaned, but basically mm. the distilled uh, water will work with the with the directionals as well because they have two holes in them. As, as that is great to, the to know. For the Omni. Yeah. So you could do that. You can also bake them and there's like there's all instructions on there. It's really well written from from somebody who's much smarter than I in that area. So. <laughs> well, I think you're doing a fantastic job. You sound very smart today. <laughs> we have one more question here. Sure. Um, oh, this is a good one. Can I use these mics on non-speech sources? Ouch. My, <laughs> my favorite. I mean, if you, if, you could, if you could look at what I, what I had here, you probably Oh, can't. look at that. Yes. But down here in the corner here, you can't even see it. There is, that's my, my beater side kick drum. Oh my gosh. Is what mic do you have in there? That's a 6,000. It is. 6, oh my God. Yeah. Uh, 6061. Okay. So it can so take some abuse. It could take 144 <laughs> decibels to be exact. Wow. And I've also used it on that piano recording that was in the video. I use it to hide inside of guitars, like um, especially mm. um, hollow body guitars. Yeah. Because you can you can hide it in places and really get the beautiful sound of all the strings instead of just what the pickup delivers. Wow. So yes, you can use them on just about anything. You can hide them on the body. You can hide them on the piano. You could use them... Um, in in nature it, they're very durable i mean they when people just say body worn the 6000 series to me is quickly becoming my favorite music mic as well as you know the the speech that's the obvious oh, choice i can't wait know? to try that that's yeah. awesome thank you so much gabriel yeah, i think those welcome. are all of our questions today we can let you go enjoy your day and play some drums oh yeah and we've also used them <laughs> on a motorcycle i was told to tell you as Ooh, well oh that's another good source <laughs> yeah totally awesome yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Gabriel. Great speaking with you. Cheers. Cheers. All right. Let's move on to our next presentation. We have Ursa Straps up next. Let's roll the tape. Hi, this is Simon from Ursa. Thank you for joining us at the Sound Summit and uh, welcome to the Ursa Studio Sound Den. This is where we do a lot of the prototyping for our Ursa products and where we sort of started the company doing the very early first makes. Um, just to sort of show you around the back here. Um, my partner Laura, who's a costume designer, she makes these patterns where we sort of prototype first with the pattern and cut from that. And then once we're happy with that, we'll then make an AI file, send that off to make a knife and that will then go to a proper manufacturer in the UK to be sort of produced in larger quantities. So here's one for a head strap that we did originally for Simon Hayes for cats. And there's some other back here which we did for the shoulder straps on our shoulder straps and back straps. And this here is for a shoe cover for a shoe product that is coming out at some point. So stay tuned. Um, but what I'd like to talk to you today is some of the new products we've got coming out very soon. Uh, the first one here is for a product you may well know called the Q5X. This is a little American transmitter used in the NFL. Uh, very popular in being able to hear like NFL players shouting at each other during a game. And why this is good is because basically if someone falls on it, it won't hurt them. It's bendy, it's soft, it's light. And they kind of rig them into people's uh, jerseys in places like this. And this product has just been taking off in the world of scripted drama. Um, either live or with contributors, uh, like on Love Island, they use these on Love Island, because they're waterproof. So a lot of people have been asking us, can we put these on straps or pouches? So now we have made that possible. This is an XL pouch, and it's designed for the larger version. This version's just got a slightly bigger battery, basically. So you can just kind of put it through the top like that. It's quite a tight fit, but then obviously it stretches out. It's got a bit of a rubbery finish, so it kind of takes a little bit of wiggling to get in. But then once it's there, it kind of holds in. Obviously you can clip it using this clip or you can take the clip off, you don't need to use it. Then you can put it on a belt sideways or you can again sew it into a costume. Like in weird places you might not normally put a transmitter, you might even sew it into the underarm, something like that. So it's great sort of options you've got with a transmitter which is so small, especially with like really skimpy costumes. And if you're really dealing with a very small costume, you can get the Player Mic S which is a smaller version, but the battery doesn't last quite as long. If you get that, then you can use the small pouch with it or the mini pouch. The mini pouch is a good fit, but it's very tight. So you can choose between the small and the mini, it's up to you. Um, 
Also with belts, a lot of people have been saying to us that they lose the clips. Um, so uh, this has come up quite a bit. So now we're just going to be giving away clips. So if you've lost your clips or you need some more, just let your local dealer know. They'll have a supply. Hopefully we'll, we'll get them out to them as soon as possible. So they'll have lots of clips standing by. If you lose one, just ask your dealer and they're for free. Um, what we've also got is we've been making some custom straps recently for our for special requirements for some jobs, which right right now with, with COVID, there's a lot of people who are having to wire themselves and put transmitters and recorders onto their own bodies and that means that they need like special custom straps with a unique pocket sizes and placements for pockets so if you're on a job and you have a, a transmitter and a recorder of different sizes and you really need something very specific just let us know we can make you a strap with the pockets in the right alignment and the right sizes so also if you want to have uh, your name put on a strap we've been doing stuff like this sure asked us we can get their logo printed onto a strap and that's really quick not expensive and uh, easy to get done so if you want to have something like that done let us know as well um so we've also been doing work on the mini mount range um this has been a really popular range and quite a lot of people coming into sound who have say g4s and larger microphones been asking us for solutions for their mics so we do do now uh, mic mounts for the sennheiser me2 and the sony d11 so this one's for the d11 this is for the me2 um, this is the original ME2, um, not the new one with the big ball gag on the end. Um, so if you have one of those mics, then we, this is a new range for that. So I think that it's a very much easier to rig them on these on the skin than the clips. And they don't come with any other mount solution. So uh, that's a good option. And also we've got a new product in the range for mini mounts. It's called the mini mount clip. And this is a little clip made from a different material to the mini mounts. It's a resin, an eco resin. And it's got really nice resilience. It won't break. It kind of pings back nicely into shape. And the idea with this, if you can see that, is it's got these little prongs and you can stick it to a mini mount. So I've applied a little bit of sticky tape to this one already, like a, one of these mini mount stickies. Just apply that to the back and then you can just stick this mini mount onto it like that. Press it down. And now that's pretty solid. They really stick well onto this. So basically, that is now operating like a clip. And so you can give that to an artist, have them drop that down their top and clip that onto the, their bra, either like that or like that. And it works really well. It's really easy to do. It's got that big prong here, so you can kind of open it up and it clicks right back. But if you want to turn it round, say you're having a different sort of rig, to get it off, sort of spin it, that takes it off quite easily. And then you can do it this way, so it's the other facing the opposite direction. Now, if you've got a guy with a shirt, and you want to clip it between the buttons on a shirt, it can go like that, and then this bit can clip between the two buttons. And it's quite, it's just another way of getting these rigged in a different way, so the clip can go on either direction. So that's kind of useful. So this is a product that should be coming out in the next month or so. We're, that, we're planning on getting this out quite soon. So if you're interested, let us know, and we'll prioritize getting them to you first. Um, okay, so uh, what can we talk about? There is a new product. You may have heard about this one already, but uh, if you haven't, this will be an exclusive to the Sound Summit. It's a product which we've been working on to make masks a little bit more comfortable to wear, and it's called the Ursa Maski. I'm gonna show you the packaging. Here we are, Ursa Maski. So it's strain relief for your ears. It's an adjustable strap that goes around the back loops of a face mask and just holds it so that the neck loops don't press up against the back of your ear. Um, so here, this is what the product looks like. It's just a little strap. It's kind of looks like that. It's got a logo on one end, two bits of Velcro on this side. It's the same fabric that we use for our regular straps. And the idea is that if I take a face mask, I can just rig it with one end like this, folding over, and then the other end folds over this end. You can make it tight. So if I wanted to make it really tight, I could go here and then there's a really small amount of space between the neck loops. That really makes a, a, a ill-fitting mask fit a lot better. Or for me, I'm just gonna have it as loose as possible because I prefer it quite loose. And then to rig it, what I do, that's the way up, is I'll just put it on my chin like this, and pull it over my head, and then I won't, without touching the mask, you can kind of position it on your face and then pinch that bit. So this is, for me, is just a much nicer fit than, than having them touching the back of my ears all day long. 
and I think this is going to be really useful for sound recorders and boom operators who have to wear earphones or ADs who have to wear like earpieces all day. And the other thing you can do with them is you can just sort of let it hang around your neck like this and by, by hanging it like here it's not pressing up against your neck touching your skin you can have a quick drink of water and then put it back on again. Now I can't take full credit for this we were given this idea through a process of talking about problems and solutions with a boom operator called Luigi Pini. So I'll take this off. Luigi Pini, a boom operator in Rome. Thank you, mate. He came to us and said, I can't stand this thing I have to wear on my face all day. Can, and he was wearing a cable tie around the back. And um, he was like, can you do something about this? And Luigi, thank you for inspiring us to get on and do this product. So we hope to launch this really soon if it's not already available. We're doing them in packs of one at the moment. We may eventually go into packs of three if people want to get larger packs of these things. So starting off with packs of one, really simple, very light. We've looked around and there are alternative products on the market already, things like this silicon thing. So you can get you know, other products for this, but one thing we noticed is they're just very heavy. Like this is an almost 10 grams. And one of these is, is less than three grams, so you can really feel the difference. And also, it's easy for this sort of thing to just to sort of come off. So you can't really rely on it to always stay attached. It's obviously not coming off now. But um, they, they, do, they do sort of come off a bit. So we were looking at alternatives and felt like this is... This is I feel like there's value to have a, a, a new product in this market. Um, and we're trying to make the price for this as low as possible as well. Okay, what else can I talk about? Ursa exclusives. Um, we've got a couple coming up. We've got one with Devender Cleary, an LA-based production sound mixer for TV drama. It's fantastic. Uh, I don't think it's going to come out by the time you see this video, but it, he just shows his whole kit beautifully organised. Uh, stay tuned for that one. Also, David Turner, that what he worked as a sound recordist on Making Waves. That's really great. He's talking all about the process of doing the sound edit for that show. We've got some with Ronan Hill and Judy Lee Hedman from the UK. So stay tuned on our Ursa YouTube channel to watch those. And yeah, thank you very much. I hope this has been useful. And thank you to Sound Devices for putting on the Sound Summit Fall. And um, I'll see you in the chat. Bye. We are back live from London with Simon Beach of Ursa Straps. Hello, Simon. Hi, Kim. <laughs> Good to see you again. <laughs> you too. Good to see you. <laughs> Now, in the video you played, the first video, I noticed some interesting patterns that you were drawing our attention to. I thought I knew all the Ursa products. Maybe I don't. What was right. that? Okay. So there are quite a few back there that Laura's been doing for, for some time. So whenever we start a new product, it because uh, Laura sort of began her career in, in well, she, she works in costumes. She makes a lot. So she buys fabric and she makes unique items for each character of a show be it like a Victorian period drama or a modern day drama so they have pattern cutting so a dress mm. is broken up into lots of different patterns and so uh, the shoulders or the back or the front is all just like a different card will cut out and then that will be laid down and cut out but we do the same sort of principle with us so we have a lot of these sort of patterns which are drawn up and then tried out on the body and then adjusted slightly uh, so the back straps are there a very early version of a F the face, the, the head strap thingy for, for cats when we were originally yes, designing yeah. it for Simon. So we had a couple of different variations of the design for that. Um, and yeah, loads of stuff. But there was one thing, uh, 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 which was the shape of a shoe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which is something we've been thinking about doing for some time. And You're going to start making shoes. That's great. Well, mm, <laughs> we want actually right now it's a real thing with carpets laying carpets on set oh absolutely because that can be some you know it's a bit of a weird one whether or not you can get away with doing it and then there's the cleaning mm -hmm. protocol because obviously germs falling to the ground to settle on a carpet so you do have to clean carpets a lot if you're using them all the time and so one of our thoughts was having kind of shoe covers which are basically mm -hmm. like walking around with pieces of carpet already on your shoes by having a slip on cut soft underbelly for a, a shoe yeah. um and but the problem is there's loads of issues with these sort of doing this sort of thing and we've been trying all sorts of ideas because the minute you slip it over a shoe then obviously you've got fabric going over the end of absolutely, the shoe absolutely yeah so you can't see that person's feet in shot which might be fine if you're just doing mediums or close-ups but then there's always a chance that they might get caught if they're walking off or walking into shot and uh so we've been trying to find the right way of uh, approaching this product. But yeah, that was a pattern to cover a person's shoes up. So you don't need to lay carpet. Yeah. 
Um, I think yeah. that's a great idea, actually. Shoe, shoe noise, yeah. That's the and it's same yeah. soft, beautiful, stretchy material as all the other products. Yeah, but the thing is, you got to be so careful because with shoes, mm. if someone slips, mm-hmm. you, and that you're the guy that put that stuff on their shoe, you got to be yep. so careful. I had a a scene with someone with cork on their shoe, and they just <sighs> slipped. Oh, and gosh. it was like, oh god, never use cork. It might work, but it's <laughs> oh, slippy. Gosh. And this was a marble. So it's yeah. like, and then you got tester tape. Same and with that's tape, really squeaky. yeah. Squeaky. So you mm. either get squeaky or you get slippy. Or yeah. the perfect solution is 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 sometimes not well. It's carpet, but you yeah. sometimes you end up seeing it. So anyway, that's what that was. Well, you've got quite a task <laughs> ahead of you. I look forward to seeing more on this. Keep us updated on on social media. If you guys don't yeah, follow Ursa uh, Straps on on Instagram, I highly recommend it. Some good content there. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> why don't we um why don't we jump into some more questions let's see somebody wants to know uh will you be bringing out black clips for your belt pouches they're saying the silver ones are shiny and, and could possibly yeah. be visible yeah. that's true they are and we yeah. are yes oh we are. great um so uh, um this is uh this is what you get in the minute they come with these clips and obviously you can you can unclip them and, and attach them down someone's side or on the but we now have sourced finally because it's taken a little while black versions oh look at that that looks great so so you can just so the black it's okay it's not matte but we you know it's a it's it's black at least it's (laughs) black that's a start yeah (laughs) so um uh we, we will be um releasing the black clips into the range and we'll be giving out a load of black clips as a courtesy to our dealers and also, as I think I said in the video, if anyone's ever had one of the clips break or lo- you lose them, uh, hopefully our dealers will have a big stock of um, awesome. clips that they can just give to people who bought pouches but need more clips. Very so, good to know. Yeah, yeah. So next time you're in True Audio or Location Sound here in LA or wherever you live, if you need a replacement, check with your dealer. That's really good yeah. to know. Yeah. Let, let them know. if they and, uh, and they hopefully by then might have the black ones cool. to, to replace. All right. So the other question we have is, will you make a special belt pouch for the, the Shure Accent ADX1M, otherwise known as the Pebble? Yes, uh, we will. Um, this Great. is becoming quite a popular quite a popular transmitter for drama now. I know it's been big. The Accent range is big in theatre because it kind of scans and moves frequencies during a performance. It's a really fantastic, clever technical um, solution for, for people sort of rack based and powered by, yeah. by in, by plugged into the mains, but they're making them much more user-friendly on set and rechargeable batteries and stuff. So these are really cool sort of like pebble sized curved edges, but it's kind of a unique shape and yeah. they don't really fit perfectly in our small or in our medium. They can kind of go in, but the cable gets a bit wonky at the side. Mm-hmm. So we, we are, we're working on a design and we're in touch with Shaw That's who great. are sending us some models and we're, we'll be making um making those awesome another new thing from ursa to look out for i love it and speaking of new things you guys just put out something called a masky it's like a little ear yeah. saver piece of fabric that goes around the back of your head i used one on set the other day very comfortable um cool. someone asked me though they were, they were trying to find them but they couldn't yeah. find them yet online where can they get them yeah we we did what we normally do which is announce something before telling our dealers or getting our dealers any stock <laughs> so this is a trend with us and we're very <laughs> Naughty, did yeah. it again. Um, so just we too launched excited. it. Yeah, I just wanted to get it out there. Yeah, I've I've got stuff to do. I just want to get it out there. <laughs> uh, so yes, I'm afraid um, we launched it, but then uh, True Audio or uh, didn't have any stock at that exact mm-hmm. date. But they have. They we should have now because the box went out yesterday or the day before. So that should be arriving very soon in, in, in the States and Canada. Good to know. And basically every one of our, our dealers has ordered some and we are giving them free Great. ones as well. Yeah, you so sent out that, a lot of freebies. Yeah, I spent most of the weekend packing freebies because <laughs> I foolishly said, oh, who would like to try one? And right. I just got so oh, many responses. Speaking so, of which, if anybody based in Los Angeles would like to try one, I have a couple extras. We'd love to to hear your thoughts. So reach out to me after this. You can find me on Facebook, uh, on Instagram. My Instagram is Kyland Music, and I'll, I'll hook you up with one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. uh, one, one thing I saw today about them is that some people, although I don't do this personally, but some mm-hmm. people wear, I don't know if I've got a mask somewhere. Oh, around they, the they, neck. They, yeah, they, yeah. Well, they wear the loops under the, like that. So they don't go over the ear at all. And the mask, you just sort of connects these two parts. Oh, I got to so try that. You, that. Can, you can wear the neck loop, ear loops just yeah. under the ear. So it just doesn't, it means that there's nothing going on here. And it is cool. really annoying. 
Especially yeah, where, got, where you have your headphones and everything else. Yeah. Glasses, headphones, earrings, you name it. It's like, it's all going on up here. And the last thing you want is, is more stuff. So, or, yeah, and the alternative is they, they kind of go around the top of the head as well. So it just kind yeah. of separates that from getting in the way. Cool. Um, yeah. Well, I think we have one last question for you here, Simon. Um, somebody is asking, will the mini mount clip snap under pressure? Oh yeah. So um, those new mini mount clips are, um, so let me show you. I've got one here. So they are made from this resin, which is different from uh, the plastic that the mounts are made from. And it's specifically mm -hmm. so that they, they won't snap, that they are really kind of malleable, but they will ping back into place. So I don't know if you can see this, but like, this is like, uh, Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. it, just, it actually like, came unstuck. <laughs> it came unstuck because they're we'll just, stuck we'll on. We'll cut that out. Yeah, but it, it's like stuck on yeah to to the thing so it kind of right so you yeah. really had to get under there okay so the, cool so the sticky tape comes off so you kind of have to take it sideways mm. like that and then the sticky tape comes off so you still like it's a separate clip uh, nice. but yeah obviously if you're yanking it like i just did the whole thing yeah. will come off i doubt there's gonna be many situations where you're pushing that hard but thank you so much simon this was really really <laughs> fun to see all these new things from you guys that's all right thanks for having me and thank you <laughs> yeah. to sound devices and electrosonics and dpa for for putting this event on and making it happen it's really cool that you guys are are doing it and um yeah i hope it well i hope we're back to normal soon enough fingers but crossed. um fingers crossed yes well thanks simon it was great to see you we're gonna let you go get on with your day now and we're i think we're gonna move on we have uh, one more video from ursa so we'll we'll say goodbye to simon now and we'll we'll play you out with a new video see ya thanks bye So this is our new product, the Ursa Maski, and it's a stretchy soft strap designed to go between the neck loops on a face mask. I'll show you how to put it on. Like that. So it's giving me a little bit of space now on the back of the ear, so this neck loop isn't pulling against my ear and giving sort of any kind of discomfort there over the course of a long day. But also because it's quite easy to just take it off and have it loosely fit around the neck. So it's not touching my skin, it's just loosely fit here. So I can have a quick drink of water and then put it straight back on. Also, if I want to, I could tighten it up at the back. If I felt the mask was actually too small, I could just tighten it slightly there. That feels a little bit tighter. But yeah, just the Ursa Maski, very straightforward. Hope you could find this useful. Oh wow, you can barely even feel that it's there. I find that I'm always constantly got lots of strain behind here where my mask sits, but this one I can barely even feel it. As well as constantly pulling it up and down all day when I'm drinking water and coffee and things like that, because I do have to wear it all day at work. And I find after an hour and a half or so, I'm constantly tugging at it, pulling it around. And my ear earrings, I'm losing them constantly. They're pulling out, they're getting tangled in it. I really, really enjoy this. Can I keep it? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Nico, pass me the camera. Oh, yeah. Hit. <laughs> so he's going to film our cameraman. So you've been yeah. using maskies, right? Yeah, you passed me the maskie, and I just, I actually really love it. I just wish I had it a month ago because I was doing a load of travelling all over the country 
taking long train journeys and my ears were absolutely killing me after, after an hour of use. Just really rubbing behind the ears, but with this, it's not doing that. But anyway, I'm glad I've got this now because I've got a few more upcoming shoots. Yeah, I'm looking forward to wearing it. Welcome back to our live stream, Sound Summit 2020. I think we're gonna go straight into another video here. We have a new video from Sound Devices. Let's roll it. Thank you for joining us for Sound Summit. I'm John from Sound Devices, and this presentation is an overview of the SL2 wireless receiver accessory for the 8 Series mixer recorders. First, a little history. 20 years ago, Sound Devices introduced the 442 four channel field mixer. The 442 was the nucleus of many production sound kits for ENG, EPK, interview, reality, documentary. The mixer shared space in the bag with wireless receivers and wireless transmitters. Wireless and mixers have complemented each other for decades. As the number of wireless systems in use increased, so did the number of audio channels on the mixer. As the track count on field recorders increased, so did the number of wireless systems in use. Fast forward to today. A modern high performance production mixer now incorporates a multi-track recorder. And wireless continues to be an essential tool for production. And more wireless channels are in use than ever before. Several years ago, Sound Devices introduced the SL6 accessory for 688 mixers. The SL6 was based on a new technical specification developed by Sound Devices called SuperSlot. SuperSlot was built on the original Ikigami Unislot protocol. Unislot simplified the connection between video cameras and wireless systems. SuperSlot is an extension of Unislot. In addition to the power and audio signal connections, AES digital audio and control of receivers was added to SuperSlot. SuperSlot has been successful with numerous manufacturers making SuperSlot compatible products. Manufacturers include Sound Devices, Audio Limited, Electrosonics, Wizicom, Sennheiser, and Sony. We look forward to seeing additional super slot compatible products from more manufacturers in the future. The SL2 is the first of a new range of integrated super slot accessories for the 8 Series. While the SL6 is compatible with Scorpio, the SL2 works with all 8 Series, including the 833, 888, and Scorpio. The SL2 chassis simplifies setup and interconnection between two wireless re receivers and an 8 series. Each slot in the SL2 supports either two or four channel super slot compatible receivers. Those receivers include Electrosonics SR, including the B, C, and 941, Audio Limited A10RX is connected here, Wizicom MCR42 and MCR54, which is connected here, and the Sennheiser EK6042. Now the SL2 mounts to the top of an 8 series. Here it is mounted to the A33. And note that the SL2 requires an 8 series to operate. It does not operate in standalone operation. All connections are through the 8 series top side multi-pin expansion port. Receivers are powered from the 8 series via the expansion port from the same power source that powers the mixer. So here we have a smart battery that is powering the 833 and therefore powering the SL2 and the two wireless receivers. The SL2 integrates antenna distribution for connected receivers. It supports passive active and smart antennas and provides 12 volt bias plus antenna loop through connections. To improve range and reduce the chance for dropouts, the SL2 offers antenna filtering to restrict incoming RF bandwidth before hitting the receiver. These low loss pre-select filters can be inserted in ranges. And let's go ahead and select that, which we already have the filter selected from 470 to 614, which is typical for UHF in the US, 542 to 694, 606 to 770, 
770 to 960, 1240 to 1260. And then there's also a wideband setting, which is just like having the receiver connected directly to the antenna. Now the combination of tuned antennas and the SL2 pre-select filters works in addition to a receiver's tracking filter. Antenna RF attenuation of 6, 12, and 18 dB can be inserted to reduce RF in situations like mine here, where I have very close proximity transmitters, potentially at high RF powers. The SL2 also offers support for controlling WYSIWYGON LFA smart antennas. Now let's navigate to the overview screen and take a look at the connected receivers. A quick glance shows up to eight RF signals, including signal strength with history and level. Now, if I navigate to an individual receiver, additional information, including the transmitter record status, if that's a feature, transmitter battery status, high pass filter, are all visible right at the recorder. You also see the signal strength histogram. And let's uh, disconnect the antenna here of our transmitter, and we could see that histogram change as our signal strength now goes away. We'll reconnect this, and we'll get signal back at the receiver. Now, each slot can accept four channels of audio. In the setup I have here, I've got the MCR54, which offers four channels. I have the A10RX, which offers two. And each of these receivers can be routed to any of the 8 series channels, just like any other input source. So let's go to an input, select our input, and we can see, I'm in your way here, we can select from slots A1 through 4 and B1 through 4. And in this particular setup, channel one source is set to slot B1. Let's get back to the RF overview. Now there's two additional AES inputs on the backside. Let's take a look at those. Those two AES inputs also have adjacent DC outputs for connecting external digital wireless receivers. Now mechanically, the lightweight SL2 is simple and elegant. Receivers mount and are secured without screws for easy reconfiguration of a bag. The SL2 can be powered down independently from the mixer and individual receivers can be powered down when not in use to increase battery runtime. To conclude, the SL2 is the easiest way to quickly and simply connect slot-mounted wireless receivers to the 8-series. We're excited to announce that the SL2 is presently shipping. 8-series firmware version 7.0 and greater are required for full operation of the SL2. For more information on the SL2 and for more additional videos of operation and tips and tricks, please visit sounddevices.com. Thank you. All right, we're back. And this time we have Paul Isaacs from Sound Devices. Welcome. Yeah, it's me again. <laughs> it's you again. The audience might be getting bored of me. <laughs> no, I'm not we love you. Anything to say. I mean, John did such a great job of describing the SL2 there. But, you know, if there are questions. I'm it looks here. like we do have one question, but I think the video did answer a lot of great questions. Someone called 2016 Golden Tree. What a beautiful name. They're asking, is the SL2 now fully compatible with MCR54? Yeah, we released version seven um, mm -hmm. firmware for the uh, eight series about a week ago now, and that brought full compatibility to the MCR54. So you've got eight channels in a bag now, all in that's slots. Great. That's oh, cool. that's wonderful. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. Surprisingly, the question section's just a little quieter today. I think you're, you're free. You're off the hook now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, and it's great to see you again, Paul. Yeah, you too, Kim. All right, thank you. We're going to keep it moving right along now with our next presentation from Dish TC. Dish time code. AB hey, Common Mark, scene 1A, take one. The clapper slate is the most iconic filmmaking accessory. Its original purpose is to sync picture and sound. The clap registers on tape and on film. Of course, modern cameras 
use timecode and it simplifies post-production greatly. But keeping everything in sync has remained a labor-intensive process. Until now. Introducing DISH, the universal timecode receiver. DISH takes precise time from satellites in orbit. Any DISH, anywhere in the world, always has the exact same time. They never drift, they never need jamming. Turn on, plug in, shoot. Say you're filming a car scene. You're going somewhere. Where people are waiting for you. Where are you guys? 45 minutes out. You get there and all the footage is in sync. Cut. Print. That was good. Say you're doing an interview across the Atlantic. Elijah, tell us about yourself. I'm Elijah Gould. I'm the hardware engineer for DISH. Our team is distributed around the world, but our dishes are in sync. DISH works in the most remote locations in the most hostile RF environments. Indoors and out, the satellite signal is accurate to 60 nanoseconds. That's one five hundred thousandths of a frame. DISH is, hands down, the easiest timecode solution that exists. There are no dip switches, no menus, no phone app. There's no master clock to set up. Our master clock is 20,000 kilometers up in orbit. All these dishes are in sync, even though they never touched each other. DISH. The time has come for universal timecode. Welcome back. We're here with Ari from DISH Timecode. Welcome, Ari. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you here. We have some questions right off the bat. And this one speaks to something that's kind of current. Um, you know, with all the social distancing and the new rules, the way sets are changing uh, during COVID-19, someone's asking, can we use this at two different locations? Uh, yes, you can. Well, thank you for asking that. Yeah. Um, in fact, we uh, uh, a quarantine feature uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, I can't I can't say who this is or or what they've done yet because their their stuff Ooh. isn't out yet, but you'll you'll see it soon. Okay. Um, they they shot the whole thing in LA, but in different locations around town. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's just
Hello, Caleb at Bubblebee Industries here. I'd like to show you our new Sidekick 2 IFB in-ear monitor. Ta-da! So we've made a couple of steps forward um, in comparison with the Sidekick, the original one. And one being the case, it's now got this carbon, fin carbon finish uh, zipper case. Very tough to protect your Sidekick. Um, it's light, it has a note section on the back so you can write your name on it or um, whether it's mono left, mono right or stereo and a QR code which will take you to all the information you could possibly need about the Sidekick. And let's take a look at what's inside. The main thing about it that's changed or being updated is the cable. So this cable is stronger than the previous iteration, 50% lighter and 44% smaller. It's more transparent so it blends into any background that you hold it up against. Um, I have a previous one over here, this is the mono right, um, and I'll show you, I think that's the mono right of the previous one, and when we hold this up against the Sidekick 2, you can see that a vast step forward has been made in making the cable as discreet and small as possible. That's the coil for the cable relief is also smaller, it's been reduced in size and in winds, but is still very effective. Um, the thickness, as you can see there, has been reduced. And the Sidekick 2's cable is very strong. Um, it's also Kevlar reinforced, but it's got some other magic in it that makes it incredibly strong. I think it can hold up to 60 kilograms. We're going to have some breaking tests to see if anyone can break it with their bare hands. Um, and that should be fun. And the connector has also been updated. Um, we found a new material and a new way of terminating it that makes the connector a slightly smaller one. And this uh, cable relief over there, we've tested it up to 100,000 bends without it breaking. So. Um, we're very confident that the durability has been improved and the invisibility has also been improved. The Sidekick comes, uh, as always, with three options available. Um, there's a mono left, a mono right in this case, and a stereo version. And the stereo version over here has this neat little cable lock and on the drivers which are very small discrete high definition drivers that fit inside the ear canal um, you have your left one and your right one and that's got to do with the angle of entry of the cable into the driver to make it as comfortable as possible and the Sidekick 2 can be worn for up to 20 hours without feeling it. You forget it's in there, so it's very important to remember to take it out when you're finished on set. The Sidekick 2 is fitted with a 3.5mm mini jack uh, and it will work with uh, any IFB uh, system on the market, as well as a host of other things that output a 3.5mm jack. One of the things about the Sidekick 2 that we really like is it's very easy to use. There are no buttons on it to push, there's no knobs to turn, it's not on off, you plug it in, you turn on the uh, unit powering it and there you go. And that's very good when you're handing it off to talent or a presenter or if a presenter has their own and they would like to fit it themselves, that's also possible. And to help with that we've actually found a new clip, uh, we call it the gator clip, and it's got a wider surface area, is a little more tensile, it, it's got more tensile strength so it'll hold tighter and um, it's a little flatter on the ends so it won't damage any fabrics. Um, so let me show you how you'd fit this. I've got the mono right one here and you get the desired length until it's clipped onto the clothing which for me is about 20 centimeters and then that's uh, normally the cable would run down my back to the receiver so I'll just feed that down and then that would clip onto the back of my shirt. Um, then you separate the driver which goes up the side and over the top 
of my right ear. And then the driver's sitting right at the correct point to be inserted into my ear canal. So once it's over the ear, it goes into the ear canal. You push it all the way in. I can close my ear like this and then reset your hair over the cable. The cable relief on the mono gives you a really nice um, comfortable wear so I can turn my head left and right and from the front you shouldn't be able to see that. It's light, I can't feel it. After a minute it's as if it's not even there. And that brings me on to the ear tips. Um, so let me show you the different ear tips available. This one over here, this is called the satellite ear tip and you can take the ear tip off by popping it off the end of the driver. And the satellite is open so it gives you ambience which is equivalent to 99% of your ambient surroundings. That's really nice if you're wearing it for an extended period of time because you don't get dizzy. Um, especially if you're only wearing one side and some people don't like having one of their ears blocked or both of their ears blocked for extended periods of time. If you want to block out a little more of the ambient noise if you're in a noisy environment or you'd like the perceived level of the Sidekick 2 to be higher um, then you can step up from... the ear tips all come with it by the way you can step up from the satellite to the Christmas tree Sorry, this is the cowbell. <laughs> Looks like a cowbell. And the cowbell will give you um, much more attenuation of the outside world. It's the one that sits square in the middle of the satellite, which is open. And let's take it off again. The Christmas tree. And the Christmas tree's got uh, two membranes there, and they fit over the driver, and they will um, block out a lot of the outside sound, any noise, and basically that gives you a lot more level to work with on the inside. So that's the Christmas tree, and there you can see the difference between the Christmas tree, the Christmas tree, and the satellite. And all of the um, ear tips, the satellite, the cowbell, and the Christmas tree, they're included in the pack. And you can also buy spares in little packs like this, and they come in small, medium, and large, except for the cowbell, which only comes in medium and large. If at any point the level drops, it may be that you've got a little earwax inside the tip of the driver there. And this white ring over here, and it's very difficult to see, but I'll show you on the close-up. This white ring over here um, is a guard which guards the entrance to the driver and we have these little sidekick filter sticks and that allows you to swap out this little uh, guard and insert a new one. It's a one use only and I'll show you how that works. On the one side, the narrow side, you have a little uh, we call it a bee sting and that you insert into the filter and that will lock on and pull out the old filter and then you rotate it 180 degrees and insert the new filter until it goes click and that leaves the new filter inside the driver then replace your ear tip and that clicks on and then it's firmly in place and that also provides protections. I hope you uh, found some useful information in this presentation. Um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to get in touch. And um, yeah, I look forward to answering them as best we can. The Sidekick 2 from Bubblebee. Ask your dealer about it and check it out. Hello ladies and gentlemen, I'm Hudson Fair in Chicago and my company is called Atelier Hudsonic LLC. We are in the classical music recording business. Uh, you can uh, read my bio and all that information, uh, uh, look on LinkedIn, 
looking at my SoundCloud page. My name is spelled FAIR, F-A-I-R. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most fantastic package that I have ever worked with. I made my reputation uh, in the early 80s uh, with a Nagra 4S machine. And my focus, as I mentioned, was always on sound quality. And by that I mean natural sound, uh, sound that uh, one can uh, uh, capture the softest to the loudest sound easily without uh, the uh, conversion making the sound harsh. Um, and something that is uh, non-digital sounding. Now we're in the studio and I've set up a, a German miking technique uh, for piano. And uh, really this would include about eight microphones uh, for a large hall like Carnegie Hall. And uh, I want uh, to tell you about this mic technique uh, which was shown to me by Thea van Geest. It starts with two cardioid, spaced cardioid mics on the piano down low uh, pointing at the wood of the piano not over the lip, but below the lip of the piano. And it concludes close up with a U89, Neumann U89 on the butt end of the piano, uh, looking up the bass harp towards the, uh, uh, towards the player. And what this does is the uh, aiming at the wood on the piano gives you a mellower sound. It also uh, it avoids any kind of brightness. Uh, pianos, especially those made to be played in a large three or 4,000 seat hall, um, are voiced very brightly. And uh, you want to uh, pick them up in a beautiful tone, but you don't need all the brightness that's uh, the way the piano is set up so that it projects into the hall. You need a more uh, a satisfying listening position. So I would start with these three mics. I would then hang uh, a high mic, perhaps 10 to 15 feet this way of the piano, and another one the same way, 10 to 15 feet uh, on that end of the piano. Uh, and this gets the air around the piano and the uh, stage, the depth on the stage, the feeling of the complete voicing of the stage. And then up here over the first or second row of the, uh, of the auditorium, I want uh, three mics across there. Uh, I want an omni in the middle, a cardioid here and a cardioid here. And the spacing on those is also about like this. Now, uh, uh, spaced cardioid is a German technique uh, not often seen here. Uh, but I learned that, and it's very good uh, for creating depth uh, and uh, getting a beautiful detail. Uh, the idea is for it not to sound close, but for it to sound very full. Now we're here with a violin and piano setup, shown to me by the world famous engineer Tony Faulkner. Uh, it uses two Coles 4038 ribbon mics uh, for the violin and two Omni Sheps uh, looking the butt, uh, up the butt end of the piano uh, to catch the piano. This, is a this here on the end here is a classic Decca Records technique. Um, and uh, you always want to have your 
uh, right hand of your piano on the left loudspeaker, and you always want your bass on the right loudspeaker. This setup preserves it, and uh, it doesn't, in, instead of miking here in front of the piano, which may be too concentrated, uh, it gives a beautiful balanced sound, uh, somewhat counterintuitive. This is a magical setup here because the figure of eight has a null here. There's no sound on the side of these microphones. So the piano is almost entirely cut out. And uh, the violin player is heard beautifully with a, uh, with a, with a ribbon mic sound that minimizes finger noises, minimizes a uh, bow on string, and produces just pure tone. International Records. For our third presentation, we have singer and piano. We're miking the singer in stereo here, and uh, that's an important aspect because we have better control over level for her singing, and the performer can see uh, her colleague, uh, the pianist, with eye contact for much better expression and to be together. Uh, stereo is important because in your post-production, in your mix, uh, or even mixing it live, uh, you can uh, float the singer in the stereo picture uh, when you have stereo. You could, for example, uh, pan her, uh, uh, her left channel uh, at uh, uh, 8 o'clock on the left and her right channel at 11 or uh, 10 or 11. You could, for example, take her left channel and pan it hard left, and the uh, uh, right channel would be at 9 o'clock. This way, you float the voice in the stereo picture without it sounding pasted on. And this is important. Uh, well, this is shown to me uh, in Germany, um, and uh, shown to me by Gunther Apfenheimer. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rainer Meyer. I'm the manager of Emi Berliner Studios. I would like to tell you a little bit about direct-to-disc recordings, pure analog direct-to-disc recordings. You need a lathe as a recording machine, you need a lacquer disc as a recording media, and of course you need a microphone and a mixing desk. Let's start. Now I take the microphone, fade up. Hello, this is Emil Berliner Studios. That's all right. Okay, let's listen to the recording. Fade up. 
Hello, this is Amy Bellina, students. We can not only listen to the recording, we can also see it. And this is my speech. Last week we did a direct to this recording here in our studio. This is a recording. Direct to this means that there is no post production possible. That's why this recording was not finished. You see, they, there was a mistake and we had to start again. So that's why I can play it to you. I will show you a little bit. This is the principle of Directed This. We have to record from the beginning to the end, one side and one go. The microphone is in the middle, just two microphones, two figure of eights, clarinet, sopran saxophone, harp, accordion, double bass. If we decide that this will be the take, this recording, is immediately the original because there is no po post-production possible. And if this is the original, it is also at the same time the master, the master for the production. This lacquer I will send to a factory and the factory will make a stamp out of it. It's just a galvanic copy of this recording. If you have a stamper, you can press Y nuts. We had a band last year in our studio for a CD production and I asked them, do you like to make a direct to disc recording? And they said, okay, let's try it just for fun. And so we did. I will play it to you. Okay, now I will play to you another production. Trio, two guitars, one double bass, three microphones, and again, one main microphone, Bloomline. Bloomline is, very, is a very good microphone setup for vinyl, because you have less out of phase signals in the low end. With direct to this, the musicians are responsible for the transitions of the pieces. They have to decide how long a pause will be. So that's why they practice the pauses. And I will play to you just one transition. Our studio also offers mobile direct to disc recordings. Um, that's why we can put some wheels under the heavy machine just to have a safe transport out of the studio into another place. Um, last year we have been at the Berlin Philharmonic. We did a recording with the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra. Uh, we recorded Bruckner Symphony Number no. Seven, and. This work fits on three sides. So there was one empty side, and because it's tied to this, we asked all musicians just to sign the empty space, uh, the empty disc. So this side, maybe we don't like to play, but I like to play the other side. Maybe a word, uh, the recording here, we have a photo. You see my colleagues Sydney and Anna, our lace and the window and, have a, a, and a look to the stage. And here is a picture of my colleague Stefan Flock. 
operating the mixing desk, we used a vintage tube desk from 1959. Still working perfect, no hum, no distortion. Funny guy, normally he works, he also makes digital devices. So we all work in the digital work world and in the analog world. Let me show you another direct to this recording. Last year we had been at Bamberg. We record a Smetana there with a totally different setup. Four microphones by Sennheiser and a mixing desk by Sonosax. An eight channel analog mixing desk by Sonosax. Um, Four microphones means six channels because we used a double diaphragm microphone, the MKH-800 Twin, where you can change the polar pattern of the microphone via the mixing desk. As you can see, a dike to this recording is pure analog. From the recording on a lecker over a stamper, which is just a copy of the lecker, and from the stamper you made a vinyl. The recording is unedited, unprocessed, pure analog, and it's done in real time because when the musician played, the recording was cut in real time into the groove.